Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 9th, 2017. This is the week in charts. All right, obviously I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm humbled by your appearance, obviously. All right, what do we talk about? Well, I want to continue to talk about, obviously, the overall market. And are we still in a bull market? And there's a few chinks, possibly, in the armor of all this. You, As you know, I've been somewhat bullish. I hate to label myself and call things a bull leg and all this other stuff. But so far, I think the market is doing okay. And so far, I think we have a bull leg underway. But there are a few things that we need to take a look at. And obviously, your questions on trading. So if there's something you have any questions on, um, in the slides for now, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides. But uh, when we get out to the charts, feel free to ask about anything. And then as far as your favorite stock picks, wait until we get to the charts for that. And I'll, I'll let you know when we open it up, obviously. And when you do ask about a stock, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many stocks as you want or until we run out of time at least. But just hit return after you answer after you ask about one, just to keep it fair for everybody here, um, and then make sure I cover them all too. So that's for your benefit. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to follow up on following a methodology is the hardest, easiest thing you ever do. And the reason I say the hardest, easiest thing is because a lot of times you don't have to do anything, and I think that's what people lose sight of. And boy, I've really been thinking about that a lot lately. Sometimes it's just nothing to do, and then people overcomplicate their lives by trying to micromanage and do something. So we're going to go back to the way back in, um, I guess it was early February, my last show, huh? And we didn't talk about that. Uh, audio is on. Sometimes um, a squirrel might get its nuts caught in the wires between uh, me and you, and that could uh, botch things up a little bit. But these are recorded, and I do put them on YouTube, so you can watch them later. Anyway, so uh, way back in early February, we looked at portfolio, and portfolio was on the verge of going negative for the open portfolio. And my point was just to sit tight and stay put, follow the plan. Longer term, that's the thing to do, following the plan. Shorter term, it could be a little painful. Shorter term, you might put yourself into a state of regret, thinking, oh, man, I wish I'd have just gotten out. But longer term, that's not the thing to do. Unfortunately, so far at least, that portfolio has worked out, and we continue to follow, follow along with that. Uh, this week's focus is going to be trading IPOs, and I'm a huge fan of trading IPOs. There's been a bull market in IPOs for quite a while, and I think now's a good time to continue to cover IPOs. Every time I'm going to talk about IPOs, I'm always worried I'm going to jinx it and end the bull market, but this, they've been, this has been going on for three or four years or more, so so far so good. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you could lose money trading or I was off the something up. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Now, this is the portfolio we were talking about way back in February. And it wasn't looking so hot, obviously, because the open profits were about $500. Quite a bit of losses in here and not a whole lot of gains. Okay. But my point was, you know what? Follow the plan. When in doubt, follow the plan. And as I pointed out, it's a code or the Whipsaw song. You can uh, do a YouTube on that after the webinar, of course. And so my point was that it ain't over till the fat lady sings, right? And I didn't realize it, but that's actually a yogiism. I'm always quoting yogi, but that's a yogiism too. So let's fast forward to the current portfolio. Now, keep in mind, my point in doing this is to just show how everything shakes out based on that portfolio from early February. We did have one trade that come in, came into this portfolio that turned out to be a losing trade and stopped out. And we had one winning trade that came out, came in, that's still open since then. And who knows, it might turn into the mother of all winner. So, I'm not going to follow up every week, although some weeks I will show the live portfolio and talk about it. But the point here is to just tough out the plan. And sometimes it is kind of tough to just follow that plan. So this is the portfolio way back then in February, about 500 bucks open profits. And then this is as of last night. 
$3,600 in open profit. So as I said a few minutes ago, there was a winner that came in and a loser that went out, but net-net they pretty much crashed out. But the point is, again, not to follow it day by day or week by week with all the new trades coming in and old trades going out, but just keep an eye on what happened with that one portfolio. And I hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully six months from now or a year from now, we'll at least have a couple of these stocks still on and they'll be at a really great, huge profit and my case will be made. So anyway, for now, let's just say bye, Felicia, to the fat lady. Now, this is why we're here this week. This is, this is why I'm here. I want to talk about IPOs. Now, before we do that, I know I've told this story a thousand times. But it's a great story when it comes to why we are here in Wall Street. And this story has morphed into many, many, many versions. And as I wrote about in last week's column, the gist of it is this. There was a bubble in sardines, okay? And people were trading these sardine tins, and they were becoming very, 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 very expensive. Again, it was a bubble. And one guy bought him some very expensive sardines. And he says, you know what? I think I'm going to have a little lunch here. I'm going to open up this tin of sardines, get my crackers out, and I'm going to have me a really good but expensive lunch. And then he found out that the sardines were rotten. So he tracked down the guy who sold to him and said, hey, silly, hey, you sold me some rotten sardines. And the guy says, oh, you idiot, you silly fool. Those sardines are for trading, not eating. And that's how I feel about IPOs. They're made to trade. Now, if they turn into the mother of all trends and turn into a nice longer-term investment, that's fantastic. But more often than not, you'll find that they're just made to trade, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a big fan of symbolism, and I actually bought this sign, and I display it proudly above the door in my office. I'm looking at it right now. And it just helps to remind me that we are here to trade. We're not here to, to buy and hope. We're not here to reason why a company should be good or not. We're here to trade. So I'm a big fan of symbolism. In fact, tomorrow's column, if I do get it out, I'll have some uh, even more symbolism about trading in general, which I think is going to be kind of cool. But before I digress too far, so... We're going to trade them. That's what we're going to do with them. Again, they're made to trade. Now, there might not be any substance to an IPO, but it's not our job to judge. And before I digress too far, I just can't help but think, isn't Snap the stupidest stock in Stupid Town? And we'll take a look at it when we get to the live charts. And some things that I'm showing you today, if you didn't do anything, if you just did this, if Snap turns into the greatest winner ever, this pattern will get you into it, okay? But if it doesn't, more than likely, it will keep you out of trouble. But, yeah, I mean, Snap is stupid. Uh, you know, you, you take pictures of yourself puking rainbows and you send them to your friends. I mean, you know, put some googly eyes on, maybe a, some kind of little animal face, a fox face or something. Stupid. Sorry. Did I just confuse the issue with facts? Now, here's the deal. It's our job to make money. And IPOs, again, can be a wonderful trading vehicle. I should have made that word trading much bigger. Now, there's two things about an IPO. Only buy those that go up and have a chair ready for the, when the music stops or the sardine begins to stink when reality sets in. In my IP code, oh, let me start that over. In my IPO course, I spent a lot of time talking about the psychology behind IPO so you can wrap your head around them. And there is this initial euphoria. They do have this, this sardine bubble characteristic to them. And then eventually, but not all the time, but eventually the reality sets in and then somebody says, wait a minute. 
let me get this straight. This company has, and I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but they have no earnings. They're, it, they, it's based on puking rainbows. This is stupid, okay? But the good news is, as traders, we don't have to worry about all that. And we know that they're made to trade, not invest or reason. Now, Will Rogers once said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, obviously, he's being a little facetious, but there's a lot of truth to that with IPOs. And I have one pattern that does just that. And I'm going to show you something that I recently kind of discovered as I'm working on an article, working on a column. I'm like, hey, you know, wouldn't it be neat if you just bought what these two simple things occur? And I'll give you the rules in just a minute. And it actually works out pretty good, to my surprise. It always amazes me how some of the most simplest things could work. And trust me, I spent many, many years going through all this complex, complex stuff and tried to make sense out of everything in the world, my holy grail hunt. And now it's like I just, I just am amazed at how these little simple concepts and little simple patterns could work. Um, Will Rogers is my brother from another mother. I, I thought I was the first to, uh, to be a trader following moron, but apparently I'm not. I noticed that he's got a little button on his, uh, coat there. Now, the double one reason to trade IPOs is they can be a technician's dream. And if you boil down technical analysis, and in no other form, this is something that I, I really went into heavily in the beginner's course, which hopefully I'll have out soon, introduction course. But people lose sight of this quite often. They start plotting the stochastic and the counting of the waves and the Fibonacci and all these other things. Gan, they can get you into a lot of trouble. Instead of just looking at the chart and realizing with technical analysis, pure technical analysis, and no other methodology in the world, there's a hard and fast concrete rule. If a market is at A and it's going to go to C and B is in between, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. In fact, in my IPO course, I have a pattern called buy at B. And then you'll see something kind of along that line of reasoning in a few minutes. So that's the beauty of an IPO. As a general statement, if they don't go up, don't buy them. Now here's the question. And not you guys, but over the years, I always get e usually always get emails about, hey Dave, uh, this company's coming public, what should I do? Well, you shouldn't do anything. You should let them establish themselves at least a little bit, at least one week is my rule. So you don't want to try to buy them on that opening day or even try to get them before they come out. Because a lot of times they just begin to die. Now here's a good example of a more recent IPO that came out, went sideways a little bit, and then began to implode. Now what's kind of interesting is I went back and grabbed some slides out of the course and I'd forgotten that I talked about Facebook. So even something like Facebook, which there was this huge excitement about, at least initially began to implode. In fact, it actually went down in the low teens before it bottomed out and finally began to rally again. So you don't want to try to buy an IPO too early or before they come public. Now, here are some characteristics of IPOs. There's the fly and the die pattern, and this could be very tradable. And as I alluded to a minute ago, there's a lot of psychology behind this. Not enough time to get into it today. But basically, the reality eventually sets in. So there's a lot of excitement back here, and then eventually, again, the reality sets in. The good news is this is a very tradable pattern. So there'll be some early pioneer patterns back here, and we're going to talk about one in just one second. And then you could have some pullbacks along the way. And this could be fantastic. But you just have to have a chair ready 
for when the music stops. In other words, you have to have a stop in place. Now keep in mind, they don't go from here to here overnight. So many times, if you're enjoying the ride over here and you're trailing a stop higher, you get stopped out long before this has happens. If you go back and look at my latest column at Traders Expo last week at Bandcamp, I mean last week at Traders Expo, I was talking about uh, some winning stocks that were very easy to recognize because they were just some simple pullback type of patterns. At NOVN, an IPO, which is a simple pullback in that fly phase, I showed it as a winner. Now, it's kind of like the before. I didn't walk through the whole trade. I just want to show you, show the audience at this, that these are easy to recognize patterns, just simple IPO, persistent pullbacks, things like that, and obvious trends. And when we got to Novin, somebody stopped me and says, well, wait a minute, didn't that stock eventually implode? And I'm like, yeah, you're right, smart guy. You are. It did, but we got stopped out long before that. So check out my column for that particular trade. Now, sometimes you have what I call the die and the die. They come public, and then they just die. The great thing about this, and I'm going to show you some nuances here in just one second, but the great thing about this is you could take that Will Rogers approach, and if they don't go up, don't buy them, okay? So if they just come out and die, you can avoid them. You're welcome. I just save you a lot of money. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that the significant high or low is often set during the first week of trading. And again, I would not trade an IPO to at the least day six, and then I'm going to show you a day seven pattern here in a few minutes, or a pattern that could set up on day seven, I should say. So let's say one, two, three, four, five. Five, that's five trading days. That's one week worth of trading, okay? And what you'll often find is it's going to make a significant high or a significant low during that period and that can set up either the flying or the dying when it comes to the IPO. Now what I would caution you against is beware when the high is set on that first day of trading. So the IPO comes public and then after a few days to a week you notice that wait a minute this thing never did get past the high of its opening day. So when that occurs, I would strongly urge you not to ever, not never, but not to consider trading this IPO until and unless it gets back above that high. And I'll show you a pattern that does just that in one second. I know I'm being a little bit of a tease. Now, if this comes down here and bottoms out for a long time, we're talking several months, okay, and then you get some kind of cool pattern setting up way out here, that's okay, such as a bow tie or a first thrust, because I do believe that IPOs have a Phoenix characteristic to them. Let's back up to the die and die. Okay, so sometimes they die and die, but then what happens is they base for a while begin to take off. So first pullback after base breakout, an IPO, I'm sorry, First pullback after base breakout, a first thrust, or a bow tie might be a good pattern to trade over here because what happens is the company gets its act together. As I said, the course, if they're priced too high, they're going to die. So as a general statement, and that's why the fly and die works, and again, I don't want to digress too far or get too far into it, but what happens is they have to leave a little meat on the bone when they come public with an IPO. And this is so people back here can get off the hook, early investors get off the hook, and make a little bit of profit. And part of the dying, and again, not enough time to get into the whole psychology of it, but part of the dying might be these people getting out to become whole, okay? And so you have a lot of players, and uh, I'm going to stop short of saying the word manipulators, but, well, screw it, I'll say it, manipulators. They're manipulated, okay? They're manipulated to go up, but if the underwriter gets a little too greedy and 
takes the public at too high of a level. I didn't really mean to get into all this, but I think it just probably will make more sense if you know why this happens. And as I said, if they're priced too high, they're going to die. Okay. And there's a lot of psychological reasons for what this ha for why this occurs. Now you don't have to worry about all that. Just know what is is. They either go up, they go down, and sometimes they go up and then go down. Now there's obviously a few other things that could happen, but those are the two main things that you need to pay attention to. And again, beware when the high is set on the first day of trading. So the point I'm trying to make is let the IPOs establish themselves. Now, as I wrote in last week's column, friend of mine, Doug Newberry, um, I used to be on his show back when they, they did the weekly webinars quite often. He, he'd call me up as a guest. and I would, It was a lot of fun doing these shows. But his joke was, or whatever you want to say, a little tongue-in-cheek, wait until they cross back above their 200-day moving average when somebody would ask them about an IPO. So he was being silly, but he's kind of making the point of letting them, let them establish themselves. Now, I'm not going to wait 200 days, but I will wait at least five days. That's rule number one before I go anywhere near an IPO. Now, as I was writing last week's column, I kind of came up with the idea, what if you bought – an IPO when there was daylight and it was making a new closing high. So the only two rules are the low of the price bar must be above the five-day moving average. And the reason I use a five-day moving average is because you wouldn't have a five-day moving average on the chart until at least, what, day six. It would take six days of data for that. So the low of the bar must be above the moving average. That's the only rule, okay? Or well, that's rule number one, I should say. The second rule is buy on the close of the first day. The stock makes a new closing high. If the highest bar was set on day one, it must make a close above the day one range. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you look at it on a chart, it's a little bit easier to explain. So, in this particular chart, the high was made on day one, okay? Now, you don't know it on day one, but let's say one, two, three, four, five. A week later or a week and change later, you know that, okay, well, that was the high so far on the move. And the pattern only requires that you have daylight, meaning that the low is greater than the moving average. Notice the moving average doesn't start until right here, okay? So that... What I thought was kind of fun was that the moving average in and of itself will keep you from trading too early in the process, okay? And it must close at a new closing high. Well, notice that you do have a new closing high here. So let's look at these closes, okay? That's a close, that's a close, that's a close, that's a close, that's a close. Oops, sorry. This is not a new closing high. My bad. So you have daylight here, but it's not a new closing high, okay? Going back in history. Now, when you get over here, this is the point I was trying to make. Over here, you have a new closing high, okay? But based on the rules of the system, you don't have daylight, okay? And also, in addition to a new closing high, because the high was set at the first bar, you want it to be above the high of this day here. And we'll walk through a few more examples, and it'll make even more sense. So... In order to buy now, it would have to be a close like this one, which is above this high. And then now, this is your new closing high, so it would have to be a close above that one. And you'd have to have daylight. So the daylight concept, you're, you're looking for, a, it's kind of a breakout characteristic. And this dates back to the mid-90s when I wrote the... 220 EMA breakout system for Stocks and Commodities Magazine, 1996, I think. And I just set out to prove that a simple system could work trading currencies. Now, let's take a look at 
this actual chart. This is kind of a zoom in. So now the buy would be actually on the close, okay? So you'd have to wait until the last few minutes of trading. And in this particular case, you knew that it would obviously close at a new high. So that's your buy right there. Now getting back to the actual chart, again, the high was established on day one. We don't know that on day one, but on day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, was like, aha, that was the highest this IPO has ever been. So we know it has to at least close above that. Now, I do have a pattern that gets you in a little bit earlier than this moving average pattern. And we'll talk about that in one second. We'll talk about, I'll, I'll hint at that, I should say. I'm not going to give you the actual pattern. But you can see here you have daylight and you have a new closing high. And because the high was set on the first day, it also has to be above this, but it's well above that. And we'll look at a couple more examples. So your buy would be on the close of that day. Now, I was doing some research on this yesterday, and I happened to notice a stock was set up. And I figured, well, I might as well practice what I preach. So you can see, in this particular case, the high was not set on day one, because on day two it traded higher. Okay? And then... Your high close is right here. It never did close above that high close until, I guess, a couple days ago. But then even still, it wasn't above the moving average. So now it's above the moving average. Now, this stock's a little thin, so be careful if you go out and try to do something. But I just thought it'd be cool to show an open trade. In fact, I'd like to show as many open trades as possible and when plausible so that we could see what happens in real time and there's no hey Dave you just cherry picked an example so you would buy on the close notice that again there's daylight and then you buy on the close now we're long this stock which I'll show you in a second on another pattern but it's kind of interesting to look back in time and see that number one the high was on the first day of trading. So notice that day two, day three, day four, day five, one week of the trading, you're like, oh, okay. Well, that was the highest bar. So that day one was the high. And then, so right here, if we didn't have that rule in place, this would be a new closing high. That's about as straight as I could draw. But you can see that is a new closing high, closed at a new high. But because on day one, the high was set, okay, we're going to wait for a close above that. So now we have daylight on both of these bars. And we have a close above that high. Now, this is an open trade. We, pl we played this one off a of pullback. And this is in the trading service. And this is the one profitable trade. Remember earlier I said there's one profitable trade and there's one that stopped out. This is one, the profitable one that's kind of so far has mitigated that loss since uh, last week's portfolio, or I should say since I last showed that portfolio back in February. Now, getting back to the frac example, if you were trading this pattern, notice that in this particular case, you see one, two, three, four, five, six. So by day, one, two, three, four, five, by day six, your new high is here, okay? So we're no longer worried about the close being greater than the high back here because we've got a high that was set that's higher. So we're looking for a new closing high. And we never did, did we get a new closing high? Yeah, we got a new closing high right here, but there wasn't daylight, okay? So there was no trade. Now you had daylight here but it wasn't a new closing high, okay? If I drew that straight, it would look better. But your highest close, let's see, would be right here. So that, you have to close above this line here, and you have to have daylight, okay? So it looked a little promising here, but it never did go up and trigger. So in that particular case, no capital was put into harm's way. 
what's pretty amazing is if you do follow the buy at B or this Landry daylight system here, it will keep you out of a lot of trouble. I went through all the IPOs with a few caveats, but I went through every IPO yesterday. It's been a few hours doing this. And I took out the super, super thin ones. I took out some, oh, I took out all of the ETFs and I took out all the preferred stocks and warrants and things like that and just left the legitimate IPOs. And there were quite a few in here. I mean, there were only two significant losers, and I didn't put any money management in. All I did was say, well, if, this, if the IPO makes a new all-time low, then I'm going to assume that it has failed, and so I would use that as a stop point. But to my amazement, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There were probably about 13 or 14 stocks out of 58, I believe, so 13 to 14 of them, that just came public and died, or even if they didn't die right away, they never would have triggered. So that's a pretty awesome thing right there. Now, I don't suggest you rush out and trade this without your own due diligence, okay? So hand test it for a while, get a feel for it, I think there's some things that can be fleshed out a little further. So on some of these trades that I put in mechanically yesterday in my testing, they had a very narrow range. And in reality, I would not trade an IPO if it didn't have at least a little bit of range to it and show a little bit of volatility. If they just come out and flatline, I would avoid them. So I would encourage you to add a little range to that. Oh yeah, the five, I'm sorry, this it's just that this particular case. I'm using a five-day simple moving average. Good question, Jim. And the reason I use a simple moving average is my general rule is anything less than two weeks, I like to use a simple moving average. Anything longer than two weeks or 10 days, depends on how you want to look at it, uh, 10 trading days, I like to use an exponential moving average since it catches the price a little bit quicker. Uh, obviously, I didn't talk much about money management, but you would have to have some money management worked into this. In other words, you need to figure out a, where would you take some partial profits and where would you stop yourself out. Obviously, if it went on to make a brand new low, stopping yourself out there would be a good idea, okay, at the worst. But you probably should put it to stop long before it goes on to make new lows. Now, as I said in the IPO course, what's the story, Fed or Glory? Uh, you know, it's exciting if it's a biotechnology or or something like that, or something that could could cure the world's uh, some cure some hard disease, or 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 maybe a technology company that might cure or help in in some problem that exists. But it could also be something like um, yoga clothes, and and that's I remember I passed on. What's that, what's that company called? Lululemon? I used to call it Lululemon, but I think it's Lululemon. Because I just thought it was stupid. They sold yoga clothes. But it was a nice, beautiful setup. I even showed it to my service and said, look, <laughs> this thing looks great, but I'm you know, it's stupid. They sell yoga clothes. Well, guess what? It went up 40% over the next couple of weeks. So lesson learned. We're here to trade and not confuse the issue with facts. But... You want some sort of excitement in it. It could be burritos or yoga clothes or something. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is I'm not going to get too excited about a REIT or something that's that's very old brick and mortar that would be kind of uh, hard to to justify taking off. You know, now Snapchat is just stupid, but maybe there's some some excitement there or something. Okay. And maybe because it is this, um, I don't know, paper tiger is the word, but <laughs> this kind of shell of, of BS, maybe that's what makes it even better for trading. Volume is really tricky in IPOs. Um, you, you don't have an average volume, so you don't know how it's going to trade. You have a lot of pent-up volume, but you don't know whether the pent-up volume is going to come in or when it's going to come in from existing holders, people who bought pre-market etc. So volume is a little tricky and I spent a lot of times talking about volume in the course because there's a lot 
there's a lot to it. So you'd have to make sure you studied volume really carefully. Make sure you at least have a few days over six-figure volume. Again, you don't have an average, so you just have to make sure that there is some volume coming in at times. Um, when you go to trade them, it can be a little tricky, too. I'm not a big fan of limit orders, but sometimes you might actually use a limit order, but maybe have the limit order at a point where you know it's going to trigger and you're willing to give up a little bit of skittage, a little bit of slippage. Because if you just dive right into market order, sometimes on these thinner ones, you can get kind of screwed and you got to be careful. Okay, that's a whole that's fodder for a whole another presentation, but just want to throw that out to you as a caveat. I know that there are some people out there. I can think of a couple examples. You know, I'll talk to a friend or something, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, I'm trading this pattern." It's like, "Oh, wow, that's pretty neat." When you when you learn that? Oh, I just read about it ten minutes ago. It's like, "Well, wait a minute, that's not." You haven't done due diligence. You haven't looked at 100 examples or more to see whether or not there's actually something there. So I would encourage you to go out and do your own homework on that. I think that the main point I'm trying to make here is that you'd be much better off waiting a week or so for an IPO to establish itself versus getting caught up in the initial euphoria. Now, buy at B would get you in a little bit earlier because you wouldn't be requiring the moving average pattern, too, okay? All right, any questions on this? Uh, let's see something. Okay, a couple of, couple of comments and Snapchats. All right, cool. Uh, not sure about income screen, but for what it's worth, I was a teenager, and Snapchat is the number one app for all teens. Yeah, um... You know, and it's free. At, at uh, Doug Newberry, uh, who's very, um, I don't know if cerebral is a word I'm looking for, but he has a way of uh, just kind of saying things in a very simple manner that make a lot of sense. And and he often says, if you don't know what the product is, it's you. It's like I, I have a friend that just plays on Facebook all the time, <laughs> and he's always posting stuff. And he was bitching the other day because, all these ads on Facebook. And I'm like, well, if you don't know what the product is, it's you. So, yeah, I know those kids are kind of crazy um, with the Snapchat. And, yeah, I have a um, couple of millennials at home, too. So I see it. But it seems to be dying out a little bit with them. But I hear you. So, you know, how are they going to monetize it? That maybe there's going to be an ad or something. or Who knows? Perhaps you're aware of it, but the use of Snapchat isn't doing those photos and sharing photos and chats that are automatically deleting at the viewing, so popular among teens. Well, you know, they're not necessarily being deleted. That was a, a, a controversy a while back. If you read the privacy policy, not to confuse the issue with facts, but we had a talk with my, my daughter when she was much younger. Somebody pointed out the privacy policy and all this. And I think they actually, and don't quote me on this, go in and, and see, see if you can find it on your own. But back then, uh, the article, somebody had put out a blog post showing their privacy policy on this. But I think they actually own your photographs once you send them through the system. Okay? And they don't necessarily go away, which people think, oh, they go away. That's not true. Very popular among teens because they're deleted. And they can create stories around something they're doing, places they're visiting. It gets shared among does it does it for it's a lots of eyes. Yeah, I hear you. No, it's it's uh it's cool to them, you know. Um, my daughter showed me photo photo however you say it, and and that's kind of a really cool app. I I would say that that's a lot cooler than Snapchat. And photo just takes. A very short, uh, I guess, uh, movie of of your picture or whatever. And if you move a little bit in it, it kind of gives you a little bit of animation. So I, I think that's kind of cool. I'm a bit of a nerd. I admit it. Okay, any questions on the IP or anything? All right. Oh, nothing gets deleted on the Internet. Can easily do a screen capture. Well, that's true, too, Phil. I mean, uh, even, if, even if their privacy policy states that that nothing gets deleted that you know something still happens okay let me get okay a couple of announcements um still we're still rolling out the learning management system haven't worked on it much lately because there's a lot going on but it's gonna be pretty cool 
And uh, what I'm excited about is a lot of the emails that I'm answering from people, I'll be able to go in and look to see if uh, if they took the quiz or took the course or what part of the course they took at all. Not that I'm going to spy on you or anything or, or, be, or be big brother. But if you're asking about questions, maybe we could figure out what part of the module you missed or need to maybe go through again. So that's going to be kind of cool. There's so many advantages to it. I'm pretty excited about that. I've been working on this beginner course for about a year. Um, like everything I do, it always gets a lot bigger than I originally intend. But that's going to be a good thing. And it's going to be a – it's going to be it's kind of going to be a thing where you might want to come back to some of these basic concepts if you ever find yourself fighting trends or holding on to losers too long, obviously after they hit your stop, and so on and so forth, and not following your plan. And I think it's going to be really cool. Uh, make sure you're on the delayed service right now. My website might change a little bit over the next few months, but uh, and, and I'll try to make it easier to find. But right now, I think if you go under getting started – there, uh, like number five or so is a delayed service. There is a limited amount of space on that, but as I say quite often, if you're on it for about a year delayed and you can't decide whether or not you want to be on the trading service, then maybe you shouldn't be trading because good traders make good decisions. Now, if you're a student or you don't have a lot of money to trade, that's nothing wrong with that. We all have to start somewhere, right? So just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, keep me on the course. Uh, check out my website, obviously, for a lot more information, and then that's my email if you got any questions. Now, let's pop up to the live charts. Before we do that, I want to do one thing real quick. I forgot to put a slide in here. But if you go to my website, and Right now on the home page, if I can find it, talk about yourselves. So right now on the home page, there's a little pop down that will come in. Not that one, but this one right here. And you can also go to trade IPOs. And a lot of the things that I've fleshed out today, plus a lot more, there, if you scroll down here, there's a little bit longer video, about an hour and I forget how long, maybe an hour and a half, on getting started in IPO. So if you take today's webinar plus this one, I think you'll be well on your way. And I do have it on sale. It's normally $497, and then I've got it on sale $300 off because I'm excited about IPOs, and I think that it'd be good to get you guys up to speed. I really think... With the bull market that we're having, it'd be worthwhile to get into. All right, let me get uh, a chart set up here. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now, and I'll get my charts shared. I guess the only rule on charts is uh, if it's something that's in the Landry list, I won't be able to cover it out of uh, courtesy uh, to my clients. Momo, huh? Oh, before we do that, before we hop into the charts, uh, before I forget, let's uh, take a look at the overall market. And there's a couple things I want to flesh out, and then we'll hop into uh, individual picks. All right, let's take a look at the P's first, and then we'll take a look at the NASDAQ and a few other things. All right, S&P 500. It's up a smidge today, obviously, but you can see nice little persistent breakout here remains intact. Persistency meaning that it tended to go up day after day after day after day for quite a while in here. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression, which I think if you grab this right here, that's linear regression. And let's just draw a trend line over this trend line and notice that it pretty much mimics it, okay? Um, I used to play around a lot with linear regression. I think it's a cool thing to do. Uh, years ago, I had charts where it'd have like a, 
a hundred different periods on the chart. It was kind of fun to look at and play around with. But as you know, in more recent times, I just like to keep it really simple and draw lines on the chart as I have here. So, so far it's a bit of a bull flag. So far it looks pretty darn good. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. One thing cool about the NASDAQ for quite a while, as I've been pointing out in these shows in the market in a minute, it's been thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, and then I guess the thrust would go to here, and then pullback. So it's been kind of cool as it's uh, going higher and higher. Kind of looks like a zigzag, and as Greg Morris pointed out, we were talking last week, uh, I think uh, a zigzag, the origin, the origin of zigzag is actually a filtered wave, and that's something that Greg talks about in his book, Investing with the Trend. And I'm going to mention that, some things out of that in tomorrow's column, so check it out. But anyway, NASDAQ, very persistent trend in more recent times. You can see it's, it's kind of going up day after day. I mean, just for S&Gs, let's put a uh, linear regression line in there. Draw a line, draw a line through as many bars as you can intersect, okay? And then just for S&Gs, let's put in a linear regression. And it's going to probably look a lot like this line here. There you go. Look at that, okay? Close enough for government work. Um, as you know, big fan of persistent pullbacks, big fan of persistency in markets. If all you did was trade persistent markets, I think you would do quite well. Okay, Most people can. Most people like to trade stocks that look like electrocardiograms for some strange reason. I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. We covered that in some of these presentations. But before I digress too far, let's take a look at the Rusty. Now, Rusty scores is a bit of a bummer, and it's something that it's more indicative, I should say, of what I've been seeing internally over the past week or so. It seems like we're, we're seeing a little bit internal deterioration. Now, there's a few canaries in the coal mine out there, but I wouldn't get too excited about that just yet. But the Rusty, if you don't have time to go through a couple thousand stocks every night to see this underlying weakness, the Rusty will help point it out for you because you can see the Russell being 2,000 stocks, obviously has pulled back into this prior little range. Now, it's not the end of the world, okay? Sometimes stocks will go up or markets will go up. And as you know, I use those two words interchangeably. Stocks are stocks, markets are markets, okay? Some individual stocks are often more inefficient or can be more efficient than the overall market, like these little IPOs we're talking about that go straight up. But for the most part, I think markets are markets, whether it's an index, a Forex, stock, bonds, etc. But anyway, notice that the Russell has pulled back into this prior range in here. Now, as long as it holds this range, specifically the bottom of the range, I wouldn't get too excited. Now, here's some of the canary in the coal mine things, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too, too much about energy because energy can often, can and often trade independently of the overall market. But the energy stocks are beginning to break down, or continue to break down, I should say. They made a little base in here. And they broke out of the base, and they kind of rallied back up, kind of kissed the base goodbye. And then, as you can see, they came right back in, and they began to implode yesterday. And so far, that selling has not let up. So if you are long any energy stocks, should you bail out? No. Just on your stop. Think twice before buying any new ones, and at the least, make sure you wait for an entry. Robert, if you don't mind, um, when you put stocks in, just put a stock in and hit return. So on, on that PXLW, put that in on line, hit return, and then that WLD, and that way I know which ones I've covered and which ones I have it. Okay, metals and mining. Um, starting to score is a bit of a bummer because now it looks like they're pulling back a little bit more than just a pullback. They've sold off fairly hard. So you might want to pull your horns in a little bit on the metals and mining stocks. Now, gold and silver obviously look somewhat of the worst here. And when asked about gold and silver in more recent times, my problem was they're at these mid-ranges, okay, between this high here and this low here, as opposed to coming off of major lows like they were back here or coming off of major highs, if you want to look at it like this, come up from multi-year highs like they did here, okay? So I'm not as big a fan of trading off the middle range of something as I am in the fringes. Now, when it comes to established trends, uh, 
it, that's a little bit different uh, pattern. But when it comes to transitions, as I've said quite often, and you go in and look at the other shows. I don't want to get into too much today. I don't know if that grass too far. But I'm just not excited about trying to catch a transition up in here when you're in the middle of this bigger picture wide and loose range, okay? Same sort of action in silver. It tried to rally up, and then now it's imploded, okay? Again, I prefer trading silver or any other area for that matter on with a transitional or an emerging trend pattern when it's coming off of major, major lows, coming off of major, major lows like this. Most areas look pretty good still, but some have lost a little bit of steam. Banks have been doing really well, but you can see they trade a little bit sideways in here as of late, but that's okay. You know, make a base, go a little higher, make a base, go a little higher, make a little base. And the good thing about a pattern like this is it is sustainable. A lot more sustainable than something that goes straight up. Health services looking pretty good in here so far. You can see beginning to rally today out of a little bit of a flag pattern. Hey, look at that. There's that linear regression we talked about earlier, okay? Or persistency, as I call it. And that's a very powerful thing. Some areas like retail look a little dubious, kind of wide and loose and all over the place. That's why I haven't been too excited about retail. And they tried to break out recently, but then they came right back in. Here's the deal. When the overall market looks like that and that, okay, avoid sectors that look like this, just kind of all over the place, all right? And focus mostly on sectors that look like that, okay? That's computer hardware. There's software. Take a look at the semis. You can see it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that these areas are in trends, okay? So for the most part, market hanging in there. Some areas like transports pulling back a little bit, but still in an uptrend, as you can see. But again, there are a few canaries in the coal mines. Energies are beginning to falter a little bit. Um, metals and mining beginning to falter a little bit. You know, maybe the dollar, which has improved as of late, is putting a little pressure on those areas. Okay. Now the only other thing I want to show you is bonds. Now, bonds are beginning to score as a bit of a bummer because now they're probing these multi-year lows. And by the way, I was talking with someone yesterday. When I was putting together my slides for Traders Expo, I like to go in and show that if you look at all the major tops in markets historically, they all had some sort of transitional pattern. For instance, like this case, this is a weekly kind of a first thrust down here. And then if you didn't see that, there was certainly a bow tie here, okay? Go look at gold bonds, uh, major Forex moves like, uh, oh, geez, euro and euro versus dollar in what, like 2008, 2007, I forget when, somewhere up in there. Uh, the major low, also in the euro dollar, the major, major low that it made when it eventually bottomed out, I remember everybody laughed at the euro when it came out. But then it bottomed out and nearly doubled the dollar. So that was kind of cool. But anyway, as you can see, bonds look like they're in trouble somewhat longer term. Now, when it comes to bonds or any other market for that matter, the absolute levels aren't really that important. Or I shouldn't say, I should say, aren't as important as the delta, the change in levels. Okay. So if rates just kind of gradually creep up, I don't think anybody's going to get too excited. It's when they make these quantum leaps. And even if the quantum leap is just from like 0 .00001 to 0 .00015 or something like that, that really doesn't matter. The absolute level doesn't matter, at least initially. But the fear of higher rates, like right here, when the market makes a pretty big drop, that could be a little scary, okay? So we'll have to keep an eye on bonds. Now, intermarket technical analysis is really cool, and uh, John Murphy wrote a good book on it. I would recommend you read it. Um, I think he changed the name of it, but it, the copy I have, I'm trying to find it on my bookshelf. I think it's called Intermarket Technical Analysis. But even as John Murphy says, as I often preach also, is that there can be very long lead and lag times. Uh, it only matters when it matters, and it seems like, and I haven't been doing this that long. I mean, 20-something years, I guess that's a long time. But it seems like 20-something years ago, God, I'm dating myself, 
it seems like 20 something years ago the relationships seemed to work a lot better there's a lot more correlation and what I learned over the years from watching these correlations or watching them often disappear is that it only matters when it matters okay I remember a few years back I, I made the mistake of, of saying something in a trading forum and then all these uh, I don't know what do you call them trolls or whatever they call themselves what people call them you know they're all over me I'm like look guys I'm just trying to help you you know you don't have to rip me a new one but I pointed out something like with bow ties and the S&P 500 and some guy came back and said oh you just have to watch the direction of the dollar and trade e minis and I'm thinking to myself wow I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get sucked into any more conversations with these idiots but Yes, at that particular time, if the dollar was up, the, the S&Ps were down or whatever the case was at the time. But that correlation went away. Okay? Now, eventually, it might come back longer term, but markets can have long lead and lag time. So bonds are only going to matter when they matter. If the stock market can blow off bonds, then don't worry about bonds. But if the stock market seems to pay more attention to bonds, then worry about bonds. Okay? In regards to persistency, have you ever used R squared together with linear regression? Um, I, it's been so long since I played with R squared, I forget what R squared is. Um, but isn't that something to do with uh, distribution of prices or something, which would be linear regression? I, I like to keep it simple. I mean, here's the thing. I'll give you a case in point. Um, I just eyeball the price bars when I set a stop, for instance. And if it's bouncing around three and four points a day, I know that my stop has to be wider than three or four points. And quite often people say, hey, Dave, are your stops based on average true range? And I'm like, well, I guess if you quantified it, they are, but I just tend to eyeball it. So if you want to play with something like R squared, knock yourself out. I've, I've forgotten exactly what R squared is, uh, to be frank. But I guarantee you, I've played with everything there is out there. I've taken these books on technical analysis and gone through them page by page and worked on systems, uh, especially back in the day when I was doing a lot of mechanical testing. So I've tested everything under the sun and after developing a few thousand systems, literally, I've decided that I'm just going to be a discretionary trader. But sometimes you have to go through these um, iterations and grail hunts in order to uh, in order to find your way and then you might find something somewhere along the way that makes sense to you and stick with it but don't try to use too many things and I always have good conversations with Greg and and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus but there's one indicator out there if you study technical analysis you'll know what it is there's one indicator out there and somebody else came out with the same indicator and they put their name on it but it's actually the inverse. <laughs> so if one's going up, the other one's going down. But it's the same indicator, but the inverse. And uh, Greg was pointing out that many times he'll see people who should know better put up charts, and they'll have both indicators on the chart. And one is always going to be 180 degrees opposite of the other. So you know what? I, I think you can save yourself a lot of trouble. Just draw some lines on your chart and then other than the occasional moving average I don't use any indicators and I think your life will get a lot easier okay R squared is a percent R in stochastics oh well what's a stochastic you know it's funny it's like <laughs> I used to do this but I guess it was kind of a little douchey <laughs> people would send me something about a chart and they'd say you know oh, stochastic this stochastic that and I'd say what's a stochastic and then they would write me like a 10 page document you know it's like I guess it's before you had a lot of uh, googling where you could just cut and paste but they would go through this <laughs> 10 pages to tell me what a stochastic was and I'm like I know what a stochastic is <laughs> so I stopped doing that uh, so you don't have to write me and tell me about a stochastic so it's like putting it to 11 no, this, this amplifier goes to 11. It's much louder. It goes to 11. <laughs> so, Jack, what is like putting it to 11? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I have never seen that movie in its entirety, but I've seen bits and pieces and laughed my butt off. Oh, my goodness. 
All right, let's take a look at. Uh, well, shoot, let's jump out of some stocks here. Uh, you guys, Momo. What a great name for a company. Momo has a Momo. Just for S and G's, let's take a look at something here. Okay, well, it's not that new of an issue. Um, let's see something here. No, okay. Well, this one's kind of wild and crazy, as you can see. Uh, but now that it's broken out, see, see, well, the only, my only problem here, let me just slow down a little bit. My only problem is that its breakout is just really this one bar here, okay? So usually I like to see some kind of follow through before it pulls back. But put it on your momentum list. It's just not, it's just not set up right now. Flipping an indicator and calling it something else. <laughs> it's like putting it to 11, huh? Yeah, you know, it's like, this amplifier goes to 11. Uh, this looks okay. Um, let's pick it apart a little bit. Let's see if we got any problem. Oh, yeah, uh, lots of overhead supply. That might be a good problem to have. Plus, this thing absolutely imploded. So it's got some really bad memories to it. So I would pass just based on that. But if we zoom in a little bit, let's pick it apart here. It looks okay. I mean, you kind of just this one or two bar breakout here. You don't want to pull back. I think it would look okay, but it's got too much problems uh, longer term. Leon says, stochastic object objective technical having a random probability distribution pattern may be analyzed statistically, but not predicted precisely. Okay, I'm going to have to let that sink in for a second. Uh, one thing, let me just point out something really quick here, and I don't want to pick on indicators or pick on anybody or throw anybody under the bus, but one thing you have to really be careful with, with a bound indicator, is that a, a stochastic can only go to what? 100, and it can only go to what? Zero. So the problem with a bound indicator is it might go up to this, which is, let's say that's 100, okay? And let's say that what's overbought, 80, you know? But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. The market can keep going higher, right? The market can do whatever it wants, but you've got a bound indicator that suggests that it can't go anymore. Well, yeah, it can, okay? That's one problem. Stochastic objective technical having a random probability distribution or pattern that may be analyzed statistically, but not predicted precisely. I'm still a little lost on that. Maybe I have to think about that after the show. But one thing about indicators is that indicators are really more illustrators than they are indicators. They don't necessarily indicate anything. They, they illustrate what's already there, okay? And all indicators derived from price will have lag, so you have to remember that. All right, TTPH. Did we just talk about that one? Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at uh, THO. Uh, no. Um, what do you want to do with this? It just, it, okay, first of all, one of my rules is you don't take stocks with gaps against the trend. So if you're looking to play an uptrend here, you got a gap down. Now, if anything, and hopefully you're thinking about shortening it, if anything, if it begins to rally a little bit, it would set up as a first thrust, and it might be worth, uh, worth a short. I'm not a huge fan of shorting something into a gap like this, but it does look like it's in a lot of trouble. So, yeah, that would be a possible short, but certainly not a long. I'm not sure what you're looking to do, PXLW. I'm going to assume everything is a long unless you tell me otherwise. Um, this is a stock that has a lot of bad memories, a lot of overhead supply. So I would toss it out just based on this, okay? Let's zoom in a little bit. I hear you, though. I mean, it's, it's trying to break out, but it would actually have to keep breaking out and then pull back, of course, if it didn't have all that overhead supply to deal with. So leave that one alone. Steve says, thanks. Another great webinar. You're welcome, Steve. T-Nut. T-Nut. Is this musician Steve or is this another Steve? I, got, I have a bunch of Steves on the service. Now, this stock has a lot of bad memories, too. A lot of gaps and stuff. And remember that people lost. That's another Steve. Okay. Uh, it's had a lot of trouble along the way. And you just had this one bar kind of breaking out. I think I would pass on this. Here's the deal. Take a look at the NASDAQ. If I can make it come up. Let's get it to come up. Let's see.
One thing I often say is match the pattern to the market. Okay. So the overall NASDAQ looks like this. Okay. So you need to be a little bit more of a perfectionist in your stocks. You want to try to find stocks right now that trade cleanly, that are accelerating, that tend to persist, that tend to go up day after day after day after day, because the overall market is doing that. So you want stocks that are doing as well as the market. Now, if the market begins to roll over, then we might start looking at stocks that are kind of rolling over. But right now, the market's going higher, and right, right now, the market's persisting higher. So you want to find stocks that look a lot like the market, okay? Donna wants to know about ESPR, ESPR. Well, this, this stock is not set up, but you could certainly put it on your momentum list. My only concern is it's had about a 300% run over a fairly short period of time. So it would be a little bumpy, 200% run, okay? Notice your HV is about 100, okay? Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, it's got some issues back here, but nothing that just jumps out at me, and you cleared this gap here. So if it continues to run, maybe on a pullback, I would definitely put that on your momentum list, Donald. Um, TTPH, we, we covered. PXLW, PXLW for Robert. PXLW, it's not coming up. PXLW. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I don't know if we talked about this one or not, but you can see it's got a lot of overhead supply, so let's pass on that one. I'm always worried. I'm, I'll pull up a stock a second time and say something different. <laughs> uh, yeah, the problem here is you want to see something trigger as a general statement. Now, I do make some exceptions to the rule, but as a general statement, uh, especially, especially in IPOs, I'll make exceptions. But as a general statement, you want a stock to, to trigger – within seven to eight days of the pullback, sometimes a little bit longer. In this particular case, this stock, if we just take a look at it on a net-net basis, it's going sideways for what? Uh, two months and change, okay? 113 to 39, it's actually down a little smidge in here, okay? Now, if you're measuring off the pullback, or if you're looking off the pullback, you can see you have, let's say, one, two, three, four. You probably got 20-something days just eyeballing it worth of trading in here off the pullback. So I would pass based on that. Now, if it breaks out the new highs, then play the pullbacks along the way. That's completely fine. PNSS, or ANSS, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, now this is a stock that's a bit of electrocardiogram longer term, but keep in mind that stocks can get their acts together and the personalities can change both from bad to good and from good to bad. Now, this one looks like it's going from bad to good because in more recent times, it's a nice persistent uptrend, as you can see, and then it's actually broken out to new highs and pulled back a little bit. I would actually like to see just a tiny bit more pullback in this one, but absolutely put that in your momentum list. It's something to watch. Good job, Bruce. I have to give you, I guess I'll give you a high five. Jane C is pullback redo. Yeah, I think so. Um, it hasn't pulled back that much, you know. That's a point change. It looks funny. He was funny looking. <laughs> uh, it looks okay. I mean, you know, this is where it gets a little tricky with the IPOs. I, I look for more perfection in existing issues as opposed to IPOs, although you could see why I would be into this stock back here because it's your first pullback after this massive breakout, okay? But yeah, it could be it could be setting up for a reload, absolutely. Bruce says, thanks Dave, I've been out of the game for a while, just getting my toes wet again. Well, you know, welcome back. Looks like you, you got a pretty good grasp on it. Well, now don't ask me about an electrocardiogram, I don't want to have to take back a compliment. Yeah, we talked about this one, lots of overheads apply on that one, Donald. Uh, all right, Soul has left. Bye, Soul. Good morning, Joe. Okay, any more? And a quiet bunch today. Brett wants to talk about fuel, F-U-E-L. 
I like their, what was it, uh, Withered, Blistered, Burned and Peeled album the best. Well, this stock looks like it's kind of getting its act together down here. It's made a nice run from lows. Was that fuel? Anybody know? Uh, let's see what we have going on here. It has some issues, so I don't know. Maybe if it could, uh, I think I'd let it get above these highs in here and then maybe look to play pullbacks along the way. Uh, I do like the fact that it's beginning to clear all this resistance. I mean, you'll have some along the way, but not a significant amount until 8 bucks a share. And if you can get in around 4 and exit at 8 or, or not have to worry about it until 8, that'd be okay. So, yeah, I think it has a little bit of a, what I call a phoenix uh, attribute to it. Sometimes these stocks drop from very high levels and then bottom out and then rise from the ashes. But for this particular one, I would let it get above this, finish getting through this resistance and then look to play some pullbacks along the way. Flex for Steve. Oh, what, you want to see the gun show? They put the webcam on, do some flexing here. Oh, flash of stock. I'm so stupid. Yeah, that looks good uh, at first glance. Let's uh, let's pick it apart a little bit. Um, quite a few days of the pullback, but it looks okay. Um, I would have preferred if it would have cleared this little peak a little bit more decisively here. But I'll give you a not bad on that one. And it has pullback. A-K-A-O. Okay, um, yeah, maybe on a pullback. Uh, put this on your momentum list. Um, it has made kind of a ridiculous run from 5 to 25. That's what, 500%, I'm guessing. So it would be kind of dangerous. But, yeah, I hear you. It's definitely a good momentum to it. Did I discuss THO? I don't remember it. Yes, I discussed it. Yeah, Robert, um, not to go over it again, but... It's breaking down from high levels. So are you looking to short that? In the meantime, while he thinks about it, let's take a look at uh, VIAV for John. Um, this this is okay. This is actually on my landed list for today. I should have remembered that it's on there, or it has been lately. It's getting a few days of the pullback. Uh, if it doesn't trigger within a day or two, I think I would take it off the list. But you see, look, it's cleared all this overhead supply right back here. It's kind of wide and loose electrocardiogram, but in more recent times, it's gotten its act together. So I think it looks okay. Uh, but again, you know, how many days in the pullback? One or two more days, I would take it off. The, off. Oh, you stuck long. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to beat you up on that. Uh, well, well, okay, here's what you do. Uh, what stock was that, THO? Just just have an uncle point in mind, okay, and then put, a, put an actual stop in place. And then let the market take you out, knowing that you might get stopped at the exact low and it turns right back around. But then again, you might not, okay? So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be a deer in the headlights, you know, because right now, if you think about it from a psychological standpoint, that's what people forget about sometimes. From a psychological standpoint, if you're in a losing trade and it keeps going against you, going against you, going against you, well, that's going to mess up your psyche. And you're going to be less likely to catch the next winner when it comes along, okay? Um, when I get, it's funny if I'm right before I'm stopped out, I'm all pissed off. But as soon as you stopped out, I'm like, I'm almost relieved. Like, you know what? Now I can move on. Um, I think I told a story in the first book. I had a friend of mine and, uh, this was back in the day, back in the late nineties, 99 more specifically, I believe. And, and everything was just going straight up. And I'm like, Hey man, you get this one. You got that one. You get this one. You got that one. Red hat, whatever it was. It's like, no. It's like, why not? He goes, well, I'm nursing a bunch of bad positions. Now, what the hell does that mean, nursing a bunch of bad positions? It reminds me, was it Meet the Fockers? You can nurse anything with nipples, right? Milk anything with nipples. It's like, what's he, he's milking his positions? What? I don't understand. So he'd be much better off selling those bad positions so he could focus on good positions. As I tell, I've told the story a thousand times. I guess it'll be a thousand and one now. I walked in the gym once, and some of you might laugh, but I, I've never missed my annual workout. And the receptionist is like, what's wrong with you? She she knew me, and she saw I had a bit of a long face. And I kind of growled back at her. Ah, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. She's like, well, sell them and buy some good ones. I'm like, shit. What the hell does she know? I've got an MBA. 
She sit behind a desk, buzzing people in the gym. Well, guess what? She knew a lot more about trading than I did, evidently. So if you're stuck in a position, number one, first and foremost, always have a plan going in. And that plan needs to have a stop from now on. And if you can't follow your plan, then just say, well, maybe one trade. Just your next one trade, follow your plan. And if you can't follow your plan for just one trade, then you might have to, I hate to be tough love here, but you might have to reevaluate this trading thing. So have a stop in mind and get out. No questions asked, okay? <laughs> Thanks for the laughs. I didn't realize I was trying to be funny. <laughs> Come for the trading, stay for the laughs. <laughs> well, you know, we can't take ourselves too seriously. I mean, come on. You know, life's temporary. You, t you see, yeah, I've been looking at that one or have seen it before, TT, UCTT. Yeah, um, it's a little tricky because your, your whole trend is based pretty much on this gap higher. But, yeah, I hear you. It's kind of that explosion gap pivot thing. And it's not too far from all-time highs. Um, it's not bad. Okay, I, I definitely would have it on my watch list, and I do. Yep, it was up 8% then dropped 12% this week. Yeah, you know, Robert, I mean, I, I know I'm beating you up a little bit, but it's just tough love, buddy. You know, and we've all been there, and, you know, I was looking at my portfolio yesterday. I've got some stupid solo stock that went bankrupt years ago that got away from me. I mean, it happens, you know. Just try not to let it happen too much and, and not to a point where it could really mess you up. Um, you know, depending on, on your position size based on the amount of margin required or, or what you actually pay for the stock, if you think about it, if that stock goes to zero, that would really hurt your account really badly, okay? So that's why you have to have a stop. You have to limit your losses and allow for the occasional unlimited gains, and your life will get a lot easier. As far as bonds, been long, DSM, get out. Well, what's your plan, okay? What's your plan? Uh, drive for strategic municipal bond fund. Well, it depends. Where's your stop, okay? If your stop is hit, get out, okay? Oh, you don't have a stop? Well, <laughs> you should have one. Um, put it this way. If it takes a let's, – let's talk about it. Let me stop being stupid for a second. Let's talk about it from a technical analysis standpoint. If it takes out this prior low in here, then you're wrong as a trend follower, okay? So definitely get out if it takes out the prior lows. And then it looks like it's in trouble. Maybe get out before that. But just have a stop from now on, okay? Life's going to get a lot easier. SQ, this going to be square. This might be a good example of, um, you know, this, let's just back this chart out for a little bit. It's kind of interesting, okay? What did I say earlier? Notice that it made its, its high in the first day of trading, and then it imploded from there. So there's no reason to trade this stock until it starts going up. It's an IPO. Now let's zoom in a little bit. Now it's kind of all over the place longer term, but in more recent times, it has broken out and pulled back. I think it looks okay, um, except the gap is a little extreme. I, I, I like... I don't like them when they make too big of a gap. I find that they tend to get a little erratic afterwards, but it look it looks pretty good. Maybe think about getting in around 1750 and then I think 15 at the worst. It shouldn't come back in and close that gap and then come back to this range. So that one looks okay. I can't argue with that too much. Jack says <laughs> You don't have a stop? Then you don't get then you don't get out of the stock. <laughs> Caddyshack boring clean. Clearly from too many movies. Yeah, you know. 50 cent for a Coke. I ain't paying no 50 cent for a Coke. Then you ain't getting no Coke. I just bought SQ this AM. Okay. Well, you have a stop. <laughs> VRML for Mr. Donald. Did we talk about this one? No. Uh, a little bit on the thin side. You know, with new issues, I could be a little bit more lenient. I mean, it's got a little bit of volume. Um, no, you got too much too much bad memories. I know you're like, day. that's way back in 2013. Who would still be holding? You'd be surprised. Markets sometimes have very long memories, okay? Okay, Phil has a stop in place. Congrat I know you do, Phil. Congratulations. IMMU. It feels a client. I need him to make money and stay in business. 
I have your best interest in mind. This one's kind of electrocardiogram longer term. It's all over the place. Um, I would leave it alone based on that. If it broke out to new highs and then pull back, maybe reconsider. But it is kind of all over the place. Thirty cents. Oh, that's that's pretty tight. So you're you're kind of scalping or not scalping, but looking for a short term move. Yeah, Joe, I think I'd hold off on that one for now. B I V D B I V D. Um, this is a new issue, and just for S and Gs, let's let's play around with it a little bit. Uh, let's put a five day moving average in there. Okay. So what happened here? Day one. Anyone? It set a new high. It set its its high on its first day. Okay. So based on the rules of the the moving average thing. It would not only have to be above the moving average like it was here, but it would actually have to close above this high, okay? And then did it do it here? Let's see. What's the high here? The high is uh, 47.50, and the high, I'm sorry, the close here is 47.45. So actually your entry would have been based with this, uh, if you're following the, what, what, what am I calling this thing? i got to put my name in it. My, my wife bitches at me because... I never name anything my name. Like John Bollinger was smart enough to put Bollinger bands on the Bollinger bands, you know. <laughs> so I've got to come up with some kind of cool name with with Dave Landry in it, so I get credit. Um, I mean, I see bow ties all the time on the internet, uh, which is kind of cool and exciting. I've even seen the Big Blue Arrow. Somebody sent me a chart the other day where somebody put the Big Blue Arrow on there. So I got to I've got to copyright these things or something. Bow ties are copyrighted, but doesn't mean you can't talk about them. So yeah, your buy would have been here. Um, as far as a new setup, maybe let it pull back a little bit more. But yeah, definitely put it uh, on here. Do HFTs take out your stops? Then do they rebuy at a little price when your shares have been stopped out? Um, I think Robert. I think uh, by HFTs, he's talking about high frequency trading. I haven't had a problem, at least that I'm aware of, with high frequency trading just yet. Uh, in some cases, high frequency trading has actually helped positions along because it can help to create persistency. And everybody loves it. Everybody loves high frequency pr uh, trading as long as it's pushing prices nicely higher. When prices begin to implode or you get a flash crash, then all of a sudden there's a witch hunt. Um, I don't worry about it because it's like death and taxes. It's not a whole lot I can do about it. But if you're swing to intermediate term trading, your stops are going to be wide enough to withstand the noise of the market alone. And keep in mind that if we're trading a little IPO, there's no high frequency trading there. It's not liquid enough. Now, if you're trading Apple or some big fat stock, I'm sure there's plenty of HFTs mucking with things, okay? And then if you think about it, our ultimate goal is to get into these longer-term positions, such as like, uh, I don't know, let me just pull one out the air, NTB, you know. I forget exactly where we got in this one, but we're in longer-term trend-following mode here, okay? A stop is down here somewhere. I forget where, but it's somewhere in here. I think it's below this low for sure. So an HFT is not going to bring it down below this low, and they wouldn't be trading the stock anyway. So it's, irre it's irrelevant to me. And there was, um, you know, I've been around long enough. HFTs is the latest thing. Before there was HFTs, there was this crazy spreading going on. I mean, crazy spreading. And a friend of mine walked into a, a big shop once and, he was uh, touring the facility for whatever reason, and he's a options trader, floor guy, or ex floor guy. I'm trying to forget exactly. Anyway, long story endless. He said, "Raise your hand if you remember LTCM." Okay. Anybody in here remember LTCM? That's probably that's probably a good question to ask. Yeah. All right, Jack does good. Yeah, long term capital management. Yes, Phil. Yeah, I know you do, Phil. Very good, Jack. Yeah, okay, well, good. It's a good bunch. Okay, so you guys have been around the block for a while. Well, 
the reason he was bringing this up is because you're doing this crazy spreading with a ridiculous amount of leverage. And that's exactly what long-term capital management was doing. And there's just this huge blow up characteristic and not one trader in the room had ever even heard of LTCM. So these things come along every few years. This HFT has seemed to have stuck for a while. Uh, I'm a big fan of free markets. I do think that a tiny bit of regulation in this particular case would probably be a good thing. Maybe just require that if you put in a bid, you have to honor your bid for one second. I talked to somebody years ago when HFTs were first becoming big, and uh, they told me that that would get rid of about 99% of the HFT trading. Not that I want to get rid of the HFT trading because I like the liquidity, but I just think that what type of world do we live in where you can't honor a bid for one second, okay? Steve says, your system, Landry, high five. All right, I got a high five back. Thank you, Steve. I swear Steve is not a show. Yep, I'm 62. Craig remembers. <laughs> oh, goodness. I didn't know you were that old, Craig. Jeez, not that that's that old. I'm Karen, duh. <laughs> hey, Karen, how you doing? Saving and loans was... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Savings and loan uh, imploded before that. Only $500 million lost then. Yep. What is what is the five day MA for the NTB chart? I don't recall that from the IPO course. The um, the IPO course we had a simple even simpler pattern was just buy at B. The five day moving average is something that I came up with last week uh, when I was writing a column. Just a simple way to show that you want to buy stocks when they're making new highs. Um, so if you did buy off the five e, uh, SMA in this one. Well, the first day of trading, let's make sure we got it all in here. Yeah, the first day of trading, it said it's high. You don't know that, obviously, until about a week or so in, right? But you can see, okay, so that was the high. So you don't ever want to consider the stock until it gets above that high, unless, of course, it bottoms out for a year or two. Then it's no longer really technically an IPO. It's more of a toddler, as we discussed in the course. Um, and then you have what, let's see, it would have to be... I think the entry, I'd have to zoom it in, but I think your entry just kind of eyeballing would be on this day here, okay, based on the five-day thing. And then you've got the course, so you would, it would actually have a caveat to where it wouldn't be the buy at B because of the price, uh, the high price above $20 a share. But this is something that I, I suppose, um, now I will, here's the thing, whenever I do a course, anything new I discover and I put into the new course, is going to be free to anybody who has a course. So eventually, once I start rolling out this learning management system and I get this introduction course behind me, which is taking forever, I need to clone myself or get a staff or something. But once I get that behind me, then I'm going to redo all these courses and you get lifetime support and lifetime upgrades and all. And very little changes. I mean, this is one kind of rare case where I actually discovered something by accident that would certainly, I'd put it into the course um, coming into it. So. But yeah, when I redo it, this will be in there, and I'll probably by then I'll have it fleshed out a little bit better than I have now. The whole point of bringing this out now is not to rush out and trade this pattern, as I said a few minutes ago, but more to just kind of show you something simple, something simple can work, and that you don't want to rush out and buy IPOs from day one. How to explain the behavior of stocks like SLCA? Well, don't worry about it. You don't want to explain the behavior, okay? You want to observe and follow. Don't think about it. But if you had to think about it, well, you got a big thrust down here, which took out this range, okay? So that's a first thrust type of pattern, and it would be a short somewhere in here. So use, use these nuances, the fact that people likely bought in this area, and when it breaks down, pressure is put on these people. Use the psychology of the market to your advantage. But don't try to figure them out, uh, Francesco. <laughs> yeah. They bailed out the SNLs and they bailed out LTCM. Nobody bails out me. Damn it. <laughs> All right. We got time for just a, well, actually, we're out of time, but let me just do a couple of more real quick. Uh, edit. This is one I liked a while back because it just looks like it was bottoming out. Um, sometimes, you know, the fly die. Okay. I talk about the fly. This is an IPO that, that flew, right? And then you probably have, let's put in a five-day moving average for shits and giggles. 
Sorry, my apologies. That slipped right out. <laughs> yeah, there was some five-day action back here, as you can see. Uh, but I did like this one not that long ago. See where I get this little X in here? I had it as an official setup, uh, but it didn't trigger, so I had to take it off because it no longer fit the rules. But I just liked it as a bottoming pattern. Uh, now this bar is just its too extreme of a bar. If you're long, stay long, but it's too extreme of a bar. Just one big bar up and coming in. I would let it break out to new highs and then reevaluate it before uh, making a trade there. Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to probably have to go ahead and wrap things up. I know we have some unanswered questions, but feel free to shoot me an email on those, and I'll be happy to get to you. Anything required thought, I will use it as fodder for next week's show. Anyway, I want to thank everybody again for being here. I'm Again, I'm humbled by your presence. This is a highlight of my week. I love doing these shows, as you can tell. I have a lot of fun. I try not to take myself too seriously uh, because, you know, we're, none of us are getting out alive, right? Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thanks again.